This is 3D Engraving. What's up? I'm Jonathan and welcome to Maker Tales, where I'm sharing my maker journey to help you go further in yours. So don't forget to subscribe and hit that little bell icon to never miss an opportunity to keep making. This video is all about 3D engraving, how to go about making the files, the basics of how to go about engraving them, but that's very much dependent on your laser. I've just spent the last week doing this over and over and over again, trying to find the easiest and simplest way to create any 3D object into a depth map file that you can then engrave using your laser cutter. To begin with, let's understand how to get these types of results. These results are done with something called a depth map. This here is what a depth map would look like. Now, a depth map has a gradient of colors from black to white. This lets your laser know where to use full power and where to use the minimum power. This is usually under something called a variable power setting. So whatever is furthest away from us is going to be black and whatever is closest to us will be white. For our example, I'll be using the STL file of this Triceratops skull. I've already downloaded it, so let's head on over to Blender. Here we are within a nice new fresh Blender file. Now, if you don't know Blender at all, don't worry, I have an entire Blender Precision series free here on YouTube, so go check that out. More than anything, just to get a grasp of the controls so you're not completely lost, but you can definitely just join in and follow exactly what I'm saying here and follow the clicks that I'm doing down here. So here within Blender, let's delete our cube and let's go File, Import, STL. As you can see, here we can go ahead and import an FBX, an OBJ, whatever other format you want. But we have an STL here. So let's go STL in my downloads, and I'm downloading the Triceratops skull. So that's now being downloaded. Let me just zoom out. Fantastic. And the origin point is down here. So let's bring that to the center of the scene. So geometry to origin. Great, and now let's just rotate this on the X by 90, the other way around, and let's also give this a little rotation on the Y by 45 degrees. Brilliant. Now, I don't have a camera in my scene. You can see here in my hierarchy that I don't. You might have a camera, so you can use that camera, but I'm going to bring in a camera now. And then from that camera, I'm going to go G, Z and bring it up. Now I'm going to go point to focus in. And you'll see that it's not pointing towards the Triceratops skull. So let's go into item. Then let's change all these rotations to zero. Fantastic. Now with that done, I just want to double check that my camera, if I hit one on the numpad, that it is pretty much almost as close as it can get to there. So just down from that line. So G, Z down to about there. And that just means that this will be the whitest it can be, the, the easiest way possible. Don't worry, I'll go into a lot more detail. Now let's hit zero to go th look through the camera. And now with our camera selected, let's go to the camera settings down here. And then let's change this from perspective to orthographic. This needs to be orthographic. If not, you'll not get the correct grayscale. Let's increase the orthographic scale now to fit our model. Now, just before that, I am going to change this to a square though. So I'm going to go over here to my output properties. I'm going to change this, both of these actually, both of those. I want to change them to 2000. Brilliant. Now from there, I can go back to my camera settings and carry on zooming out in my orthographic scale. So I get something around about there. Brilliant. Now from here, I'm going to just change a couple more settings, which is our render engine. I want it to be in cycles. I also want it to be in GPU compute because most of us will have a more powerful GPU than CPU to be able to compute this. On top of that, we're going to go to our film drop down here and turn on transparent. This will make sure that will let us remove the background if we want that removed. Now, lastly, just before we render this out, there is one more little setting that if we go over 
to our output properties. I don't know if this does much of a difference, but change this color depth to 16. This would mean that we have a smoother grayscale transition. So now with that done, let's go ahead and click on render. Now with our camera rendered out, this is sort of the result we should be getting. And trust me, this is what we're wanting. You don't need any lights or anything else because now the real magic happens inside of the compositing tab. Now don't be scared here. I understand this can be quite overwhelming, but it's very simple what we're doing here. So we're going to turn on use nodes and then here within the compositing, we're actually don't even need this. So let's disconnect that. And now let's get ourselves a viewer to see what exactly we're doing. That's shift A, and then we go search and let's put in viewer. So with a viewer, we'll just put that over here and we're gonna put the depth over to the image. Now I'm just gonna scale this background. So you click the viewer, this lets me scale this in and move this off to the side a little bit. And let's just change this so we have more viewing space for you guys. Fantastic. So with that there, we're going to add just a couple more nodes. First one, and most importantly, is we need to normalize our data. So when we click this over on this line, you can see we almost already have our end result, but it's the other way around. So let's go and add an invert. So click on invert, put that on the line. It's now inverted. Okay, brilliant, but I would like to have a little bit more control of what our output is here. Okay, well, let's go shift A. And what I like using is something called gamma. So with the gamma, you will now be able to move this up and down and you can see we get the change. If you hold down shift, you will move in decimal places. So you have a little bit more precision. So I don't know, let's go for something around there. Brilliant. Now, if you're not happy with how white the white is and how black the black is, and this one's completely optional, you do not need this one. I usually just output this here. There is one other one, which is called an RGB curves. So I'm sure you've used one of these before. So with RGB curves, you're able to change the curves here to be more in line of what you're looking for by adding more contrast to the image. But for me, I'm going to remove this RGB curves, reconnect the image there, and I'm gonna use this as my output. Now there is one last thing. If you're not wanting this black background, there is a very easy way to remove it. Because we've set this up as a transparent, we can now just get our alpha and connect it to the alpha of the viewer. And there you have it. That there is the final output image. So let's put this out. Click on the viewer. Now we're gonna to go to item, save this image as, and just decide where you're gonna put it. And I'm gonna put it here and I'm gonna call it try depth and save that image. Now, of course, there are other formats. Maybe an open EXR might have more or an HDR might have more bit. But to be honest, I've had perfect results with just a PNG. So save this image as, and now let's go over the laser settings. So after many, many, many attempts and a lot of testing, this here is what I found works the best for me for my three millimeter laser ply. So this is a four pass process. So remember that I'm using a Glowforge, which is a CO2 40 watt laser. The settings for all of my passes are up on screen right now. The main difference is on my first pass, I do have a minimum power of 10. My second pass, I've removed that minimum power so that it can go to zero. On my third pass, I put down the power, but increase my resolution. And with my final pass, I just decrease the power once again, and I go to the highest resolution that I can. Now here's the magic trick. Yes, right this minute, it looks atrocious. And trust me, I really thought there was a problem here. But then after a little bit of research, I found the craziest solution, which is quite frankly, 
wash this under a tap gently with a toothbrush. The change is astounding, and as long as you're gentle, no details will be lost. Do keep in mind that every single material and laser is going to come out with different outcomes. There's nothing I can really do to help you further than this. But I really do think that if you follow the current structure that I have set up on my four passes, you might even be able to do it with two, that you will eventually get to a desired effect that you like. Now, of course, this took me between 8 to 12 laser hour time to get me to this end result. But I'm really happy that I did because now I have a whole really powerful new tool to add to my laser engraving toolkit. I also did a little bit of playing around with some hardwood and with some acrylic, which gives some really interesting results, especially with the acrylic where you'd be able to shine a light from the side of it because that gives you like a a 3D hologram sort of effect, and the hardwood, you could get some really good resolution, but unfortunately, I didn't have any good hardwood around. I think the best might be maple or cherry, but once again, that's on your hands to do some really deep testing to get some fantastic results. Now, while we're at it, I also wanna just show you how to really easily get some very clean cut lines from this. Because maybe you're wanting to create a 3D engraved badge and you're wanting the outline of this. Well, instead of sitting there with a the pen tool to do all this, we're gonna do this. We're gonna set the gamma to something crazy like 6,000 or even higher, because I still have a little bit more of a white point there. Let's go 12,000 and there we go. Let's go with that and now we're going to export this as a PNG and then we'll bring it in to Inkscape. Now here within Inkscape let's go ahead and bring in both of these images. We're going to bring in our tri depth and our tri depth cut. They're both going to come here right next to each other. Now what we need to do is first of all let's grab these both because they are the same size and let's center line them on top of each other. The reason for this is because I don't think that our cut is exactly center aligned. Now, once they're both on top of each other, let's select your cut one, and we're gonna go to Path, Trace Bitmap. Then we're gonna click OK, and as easy as that, we now have a bitmap created. So I'm just going to grab this bitmap. I'm just going to move this three to the side. One, two, three. I'm going to select the image that's the background, delete that, and bring this bitmap back. One, two, three. Now I'm just going to add a stroke, remove the fill, and that there has a perfect vector cut line all the way around this. And it's as simple as selecting both of these scaling them to your desired scale that you're wanting, putting them in our export, and then just saving this as a PDF and then uploading it to your own laser cutting software. You now know how to create your own 3D laser engraving file from Blender. Me personally, I really think that creating your own objects instead of downloading things from the internet such as STLs and OBJs is going to give you much better results because you're able to control the high points and the low points and really where you're wanting the laser engraving to truly shine. Now, if you don't know Blender yourself, I have an entire precision modeling course completely for free here on YouTube. The link is down in the description. A huge thank you to my patrons. You guys are absolutely awesome and it means so much to me. And if you enjoy the content that I'm making here and you think I'm worthy of your support, I'd love to have you there too. Don't forget that I do have a Discord channel now that you can go ahead and join. The link is down in the description. Thank you for watching, keep making, and let the quest continue. <laughs>